Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Hood River County in Oregon, I drove four friends up from Portland to the south side of Mount Hood to spend three days on the trail that goes around the mountain. We were all 17 or so, and there were two other couples and myself. On the second day, we had made it only to the east side of the mountain going clockwise. I think it was called Sherwood Camp. We found the campsite late and decided to set up on our own near a creek on the opposite side of the trail from the campground sign a hundred yards or so off the trail in a fairly level open part of the forest. There was a creek nearby, there were huckleberries out, and we set up our three tents close together. The next morning, I got up at about 5.30, but noticed from my tent flap that the others had all slept in. Some movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreens caught my eye. I saw a large, light beige-colored creature, all covered with hair, seven to eight feet tall. It's back to me, trying to reach something, a branch, I guess, about 15 feet off the ground, not more than 10 feet away was this other creature, the same but small and all covered with hair, except for the front of the hands, the bottom of the feet, and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high, and was bending over, picking up a stick, which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set, I could not make out any of the front of her because she was turned away from me almost the whole time. About a minute, I thought she was the little one's mother. She gave a kind of grunt at the little one like she didn't want him doing that and he dropped the stick. At that moment, I was on all fours leaning out of the tent, trying to see better and my hand popped on a twig and the big one looked right at me. But all she did for a second was grunt again at the little one, and she reached down, stepped over, and took his hand. It was like she was motioning for him to go with her and looked in my direction one more time, grunting softly again, and they were gone behind the trees. Their faces were like an ape around the lips and jaws. You know, their jaws jutted out a bit. Their heads weren't pointed, but I could see by the bare patches around the eyes and skin on their hands, their skin was a kind of brownish gray. My friends never saw anything, but after we hitchhiked back to the jeep and were on the way out, I slowed down for a ranger and he stopped to make sure we were okay. He was an older guy. I didn't get his name. He had gray hair and a bit of a paunch. He was a nice guy. He said this was his first season doing this, and when I told him what I had seen, his eyebrows kind of went up. I didn't report this to anybody else. Well, when the big Bigfoot walked away, she sort of waddled from side to side a bit. I never ended up looking for tracks because I was scared. We just all got up and packed up after breakfast, and I didn't even want to go over there. All in all, it was kind of scary, but really fascinating. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than a minute, a minute and a half at most, but it seemed like five. The details really stuck in my mind. I noticed a light fog, Curiously, not a lot of other wildlife or birds were observed. There was a good berry crop. It is dense, mature Pacific coastal forest with Douglas fir, western hemlock, pine, spruce, cedar, alder, and an understory of huckleberry, blueberry, and salmonberry. On to the next one. In Wasco County, a man and his son were hunting elk when the father saw a creature about 100 yards away. It appeared to be a Bigfoot, about 5 foot 6 inches tall, with a large barrel chest, long arms, long strides, and hairy, dark brown in color. 
It walked with a stooped-over posture and with bent knees. On to the next one. In Clackamas County in Oregon, I was 15 years old and lived past the town of Malala in Dickey Prairie, and our house sat right on the river. It was early evening, right before dusk. My girlfriend and I were down, almost under the bridge where we swam in the summer. It was still warm right before school started. I guess we were just goofing off down there. It was the best thing to do out in the country. We had so much freedom. We wandered the hills, forests, and old logging roads all the time. I really don't remember what made us look across the river at exactly the same time. Maybe it was a sound or just a feeling. And it was only a flash. But between the trees, I saw a huge man-like being running. It was dark in color, dark brown to almost black, and covered in hair. It had to be about seven and a half feet tall. I had lived out there, and being a tomboy, I had prowled all through the woods. I had never been scared out there alone, and even miles from my home on my horse, what I saw was not a bear or a friend playing a trick. The way it ran was so human-like. The way the arm was bent at the elbow and the knee, it stood up just slightly stooped and it ran fast. It gave us a quick look while it was running and then disappeared. We looked at each other and we ran home. As soon as we reached the house, we talked. We had both seen the same thing. We ran inside the house to tell my parents. But of course, no one believed us. The only thing that I really remember was that it seemed to want to get away from us as quickly as we wanted to get away from it. There were two of us, walking quietly, talking about boys. Remember, we were teenage girls. The only people I told thought we were making up the entire thing. It was right before dusk in late summer. It was a beautiful warm day. Riverbed, rocks, no beach, forest, lush ferns, and fallen logs and such. It is the point where a stream meets the Malala River. It was on the far side of the river. On to the next one. In Wasco County in Oregon, I observed an unknown creature walking rapidly as my son was approximately 200 yards behind. I observed the creature for several minutes, about a hundred yards away. It fit the general description of Bigfoot, except it was approximately five foot six to six feet tall. It had a large barrel chest, long arms, long strides, and was hairy, dark brown in color. My son and I were elk hunting, but he did not see it. But the creature was walking away from his direction and moving southeast. It was a mountainous area of timber canyons with the open hillside. I observed the unknown creature walking along the open hillside area while elk hunting. Elevation was about 2,500 feet, temperature 20 below, and about one foot of snow on the ground. On to the next one. A truck driver was driving over Cabbage Hill near Pendleton on the I-84 at around 1.30 a.m. when he came around a curve and saw a creature that appeared as startled to see him as he was to see it. He stopped the truck and the top of the creature was above the hood of the truck, which was six and a half feet above the ground. It stared at him through the windshield. It was a blondish brown. It had bright, yellowish-red eyes, but was not as hairy as a bear. Though with hair covered, the nose was human-like, as was the mouth. And it had long teeth, but no fangs. The belly button was long and deep, and it had an innie. It walked like an old man with a backache, bent slightly forward and stiff. It straightened straight up after it hid the hood of the truck, with both hands and seemed mad that it had invaded its space. The witness woke his co-driver, who only saw it leaving as it ran into the woods. 
On to the next one. In Curry County in Oregon, location within Cape Blanco State Park, I saw two sets of Bigfoot tracks on the north end of Cape Blanco Beach at approximately 7.30 a.m. The largest track was about 18 inches long. The smaller track was about 13 inches long. I followed these side-by-side tracks for two miles until they disappeared into a deep forest. It was open sand beach to scrub pine forest. On to the next one. In Hood River County in Oregon, I drove four friends up from Portland to the south side of Mount Hood to spend three days on the trail that goes around the mountain. We were all 17 or so, and there were two other couples and myself. On the second day, we had made it only to the east side of the mountain going clockwise. I think it was called Sherwood Camp. We found the campsite late and decided to set up on our own near a creek on the opposite side of the trail from the campground sign a hundred yards or so off the trail in a fairly level open part of the forest. There was a creek nearby, there were huckleberries out, and we set up our three tents close together. The next morning, I got up at about 5.30, but noticed from my tent flap that the others had all slept in. Some movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreens caught my eye. I saw a large, light beige-colored creature, all covered with hair, seven to eight feet tall. It's back to me, trying to reach something, a branch, I guess, about 15 feet off the ground, not more than 10 feet away was this other creature, the same but small and all covered with hair, except for the front of the hands, the bottom of the feet, and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high, and was bending over, picking up a stick, which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set, I could not make out any of the front of her because she was turned away from me almost the whole time. About a minute, I thought she was the little one's mother. She gave a kind of grunt at the little one like she didn't want him doing that and he dropped the stick. At that moment, I was on all fours leaning out of the tent trying to see better and my hand popped on a twig and the big one looked right at me. But all she did for a second was grunt again at the little one, and she reached down, stepped over, and took his hand. It was like she was motioning for him to go with her and looked in my direction one more time, grunting softly again, and they were gone behind the trees. Their faces were like an ape around the lips and jaws. You know, their jaws jutted out a bit. Their heads weren't pointed, but I could see by the bare patches around the eyes and skin on their hands, their skin was a kind of brownish gray. My friends never saw anything, but after we hitchhiked back to the jeep and were on the way out, I slowed down for a ranger and he stopped to make sure we were okay. He was an older guy. I didn't get his name. He had gray hair and a bit of a paunch. He was a nice guy. He said this was his first season doing this, and when I told him what I had seen, his eyebrows kind of went up. I didn't report this to anybody else. Well, when the big Bigfoot walked away, she sort of waddled from side to side a bit. I never ended up looking for tracks because I was scared. We just all got up and packed up after breakfast, and I didn't even want to go over there. All in all, it was kind of scary, but really fascinating. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than a minute, a minute and a half at most, but it seemed like five. The details really stuck in my mind. I noticed a light fog, Curiously, not a lot of other wildlife or birds were observed. There was a good berry crop. It is dense, mature Pacific coastal forest with Douglas fir, western hemlock, pine, spruce, cedar, alder, and an understory of huckleberry, blueberry, and salmonberry. On to the next one. The following come from the Daily Independent newspaper 
in the Sunday, May 20th, 1979 edition. Mount Vernon Monster Haunts Woods Wrecks Peace, Alexandria, Virginia. George Washington once slept here, but he might find it harder nowadays. A strange something is at large, wailing or screaming nightly, a mile from the ancestral home of the father of his country. For nine noisy months, the mystery creature has haunted a patch of woods surrounded by $150,000 homes near Mount Vernon, wrecking the peace and defying spotting and identification. Local teenagers have caught its act on tape, the Mount Vernon monster, some call it, others Bigfoot. More guests, hoot owls, loud frogs, a radio with a stuck button, wild boars, a prankster with a bullhorn, or the ghost of George Washington's pigs. One person suggested a peacock, said George Thickman, Fairfax County game warden, who has ruled out bears, bobcats, and other fauna found in the vicinity. The peacock theory may not be too exotic. Experts at the nearby Mason Neck Wildlife Refuge said peafowl are often kept as yard pets in the south. One could have flown the coop and fluttered over to Mount Vernon. They have a loud, penetrating cry, almost like a scream, said John Aldrich, a retired fish and wildlife researcher. Mike Morgan of the National Zoo said the birds used to escape frequently when allowed to roam the grounds. Whatever it may be, the creature is elusive as well as vocal. It has foiled police watchers, flyovers by U.S. Park Police helicopters, volunteer youth patrols, and the determined efforts of Warden Stickman. The thing seems to know when you leave the woods. Then it starts to holler, said Stickman, who staged a fruitless overnight vigil to catch the interloper. Meanwhile, residents continue to discuss the problem at get-togethers, playing tapes and advancing theories. Maybe it's a wounded animal or bird with damaged vocal cords, said Maggie Oyer, who thinks the sound it makes is a low wailing. One resident, Thelma Crisp, said she spotted the monster. She described it as a creature about six feet tall, which lumbered into the woods after being sighted. Could it be a Bigfoot trying to reach the headquarters of the Fish and Wildlife Service in Washington, 15 miles away? If it's Bigfoot, and there's proof, said a spokesman, we'd protect it. On to the next one. Near Farmville in Amelia County in Virginia. My ex's stepfather was born in Amelia County, Virginia. So my husband hunted a lot there with his stepfather who had family land there. I would sit in the car while he went hunting. It was getting dark around dusk and I could hear children playing but I just overlooked it. A few minutes later, my husband scared me when he came up to the car from the rear and eased the door open to put his shotgun in the back. He was uneasy about something, so I asked him what was wrong. He told me to roll up the car windows, but leave a crack for air. He was scaring me, which he never did. He was scared of nothing. He pointed to a large tree in the field ahead of us. It made the hair on my neck rise and a chill go down my back. I still feel that fear even today. It looked like two of them just crawling around a huge oak tree. One of them went behind the tree, then appeared at the base, and looked around the tree at us. Chill ran down my spine, and we started the car, and we left. We were going to spend the night, but drove home to Lynchburg, Virginia that night. He never went back to that spot again and it took him a long time to even go back there hunting. I heard nothing except the sounds of children playing and noticed no other sounds or animals around. It was very quiet. It was just me and Andrew, but we told a lot of people about it. It was dusk, warm but not hot, on a clear day. It was open field in the middle of farmland that went on for miles and miles. Andrew said there were all kinds of tales but nothing ever said or reported to anyone. On to the next one. In Little Brunswick County in Virginia, I was in junior high school for Crew Junior High, which no longer exists. I was riding on a school bus on a back road in Greensville County, Virginia, after competing in a junior high school basketball game with my teammates. 
We had lost the game, so my coach had told everyone on the bus ride he wanted no talking on the ride home, back to Nottoway County. Well, almost everyone on that bus was asleep or trying to go to sleep because we could not talk. This is when I saw it. About 75 to 100 yards away from the road down a hill was a cornfield with a scarecrow on a wooden cross in the middle of it. I saw out the foggy window because it was early winter, a huge figure standing like a man with hair all over it. I could tell it had hair because it was thick and long from under its arms. It had to be about eight to nine feet tall because its head was at the chest area of the scarecrow on the wooden cross. It was huge and massive. It appeared to be looking at the scarecrow. As the bus drove by, I sat up in the seat to try to get a better look out the window because I had the window cracked to get some air. I yelled at my coach and everyone on the bus, did you see that? They all laughed and joked on me. I tried to get my coach to turn around and go back. He was so mad at the team for losing the game, he told everyone to be quiet and not to say another word or we would be running laps the next day. So I did not say anything else. It was about 10 to 10.30 p.m. It was a grassy wooded area except for the cornfield and a dirt road leading to it. What I saw that night has haunted me for a long time. On to the next one. In Prince George County, Virginia, during early fall when I was in the ninth grade, several of my friends and I were playing war in the woods of the Petersburg National Battlefield. We rode our bikes to one of the wooden fortifications next to a stream. That was our base, where we parked our bikes. We would form teams and, on this day, throw pebbles for a kill when you found someone. So, one team would wait three minutes while the other team hid. During one of our breaks, I was busting some softball-sized rocks against each other in the stream to see the crystals inside. After we were done, near sunset, we started riding back to the base housing and I remembered the rocks and decided I wanted to go back and get some of the chips. So two of my friends and I doubled back and coasted downhill, then up the embankment. We stopped at the top and upon looking down at the stream, saw what looked like a black bear in the stream where I had left the rocks. When it stood up on two legs, turned around and looked at us, we all started screaming because it was not a bear at all. Though we were 40 feet apart, we did not see a face, but the smell was like roadkill. It then ran on two feet without making any sound that I could hear north along the stream faster than we could have rode our bikes. We rode back toward the base and gathered older kids playing basketball and went back searching with sticks, rocks, and mop holes. No tracks or other signs beyond a few more turned over rocks in the stream were found. We decided it was either a Bigfoot or some advanced all-over hair ghillie battle suit with six million dollar man-powered legs. It smelled like roadkill and was turning over rock in the stream bed. No sounds were heard. It was like the quiet before a tornado. The whole day was weird and we were heading back while the lighting was good because it felt strange. None of us went back into the woods again. There were three witnesses. We were bike riding near sunset, sun about one fist above the horizon. It was a partly cloudy day, t-shirt weather about 75 degrees. The area was old forest around a stream below Civil War, earthen fortifications. On to the next one. In Henry County, Virginia, I'd gotten up in the middle of the night to get a drink. After leaving the kitchen, I went to the back door to look out the window. There is a road about 100 yards from the back of my house with a dusk to dawn light that is still there in the same location today. As I stood there, I noticed something start up the bank toward the road from our field. It cleared the road in one stride. I cannot give any clear physical dimensions because of the distance and it being night. But because of the dawn to dusk light, I could tell that it was not a man. It had wide shoulders and long arms and was hairy. I stood there, frozen for a moment, and kept looking to see if it would return. After a few moments, I went back to bed. But 
This does not end here. The next day, I went next door to my great-grandmother's house to check on her. During our conversation, she looked at me and said, I started to call you last night. What for was my response? Someone was standing outside my window around 3 a.m. When she said this, the hair stood up on my neck. Before I could say anything else, she looked at me square in the eye and said, He was big. He was as tall as the top of my window. You need to understand, my great-grandmother's home was built in the late 1800s and had the old four-foot-tall windows. I stand six foot three, and the top of the window inside the house was over my head. Outside from ground level, this person would have to be close to eight feet tall. I then proceeded outdoors where I found a large section of grass had been flattened outside her window. There was only one footprint, and it was in the direction it would have been walking to the road. The print was approximately 18 inches long and about 8 feet wide. I never told my great-grandmother what I saw the night before, and to my knowledge, she never mentioned this to anyone else. This incident is as clear today as it was all those years ago. I never heard any stories from anyone else in the area. I have kept trying to play this off as a hoax, but it just doesn't make sense. Why would someone go to all that trouble to hoax a sighting for the possibility of being seen by one 88-year-old woman? I also noticed that it was at least eight feet tall with long arms and a very long stride. I can't guess the weight because of the distance and nighttime. It was a cold, clear night in the Christmas season. The area was an open field and not heavily wooded. The dusk to dawn light is still in the same location. On to the next one. Near Plant City in Hillsborough County in Florida. I got off work around 2 a.m. and was going home. I took a left on Hopewell Road off Highway 39 and made a left turn on the road. As I was driving less than a minute, a car heading to me was speeding and flashing their high beam. I didn't know if this was teens playing around or somebody that had too much to drink, so I blew it off. As I was coming to the curb, there is a fence, maybe four to five feet tall. As I was going around, the curve in my headlight caught something that looked to be three to four feet taller than the fence. It looked at me with these red eyes. I felt numb. I always think about the other person that was driving that night. What did they see? On to the next one. It was a weekend in October on a Friday night. My girlfriend and I decided to go to Alexander Springs camping for the weekend. We were living in Ormond Beach, Florida, approximately one hour away from Alexander Springs. This was a spur-of-the-moment idea that Friday afternoon. We rushed around to pack our four-man tent, lawn chairs, coolers, and get groceries for the weekend, and a case of oysters. We headed for the spring, and we were in a hurry to get there so we could set up our tent. By the time we got our tent set up, it was turning to dust. We realized we had forgotten to buy firewood, so we went into town to purchase a load of wood that would fill the trunk of the car. By the time we got back, it was dark. The campground had some lighting for safety purposes, I guess in case one had to walk to the bathroom and shower facilities. We started a fire, and we also began cooking steaks on the grill and eating oysters and other snacks. We had plenty of food to last the weekend packed in our cooler. We ate our food, cooked on the grill, then played cards till about 3 a.m. We decided to quit and go to sleep so we could get up early to check out the site. My girlfriend fell asleep right away, and I laid there for about a half an hour with a headache and couldn't go to sleep. I was listening to what sounded for sure like raccoons chattering around our site. I figured they may be looking for crumbs. Suddenly, the noise of raccoons stopped and everything was silent. I thought it was strange, such a sudden silence, and I smelled what seemed to be the scent of a skunk. I thought that was strange because I had been living in Florida for 20 years, 
and I never smelled a skunk. I thought there were no skunks in Florida. I sat up thinking I would go outside the tent and see what was going on when I looked to my right and I saw a shadow cast on the tent from the lighting in the campground. What looked to be like a man and my first thought was, surely no other campers would take our food in the night. It made a noise that I questioned was a bear but didn't sound like any bear noise I'd ever heard and I'm originally from Upper Michigan near the Great Lakes a very remote area with a lot of bears, and I had seen and heard many in my life. Then I got to thinking this figure was standing up and not on all fours, and was so tall. I thought it couldn't have been a man stealing our food. There were not many campers on the ground that night either. At first, I was approaching the door of the tent to go out and investigate when I heard the strange noise again. It sounded like a grunt noise. I did not feel this was a bear, but couldn't imagine what it was. I was somewhat frozen in fear for a minute. Then I started talking to my girlfriend, trying to wake her up, and she was scared. We only had one small flashlight and no weapons as we sat there, stating we wish we had a gun. So I did not go outside of the tent, but could not go to sleep that night. The next morning, at early daylight, we came out of the tent to find a mess. Our coolers had been ransacked, most of the food gone. I attributed this to the raccoons, but realized they were not there long enough to make such a mess, I didn't think. So, we just laughed about it most of the day and joked about Bigfoot, but never did we actually think that was what may have been outside of our tent and eating our food. We had to go into town for more groceries that day. Late that night, things felt strange, and it had been lightly raining all day, to a heavier rain by nighttime. We sat in the tent, playing cards, talking about this thing I saw outside the tent. We decided to get out quick, packed our stuff up, and even left the tent. At work a couple of days later, I asked a friend at work, who had been there the week before camping, if she had ever seen any bear there, and she said yes. But when I told her what I saw, she said it sounded too weird. It took a few days before I unpacked the car and then realized we had left behind the tent. I called the ranger at Alexander Springs and told them we had left our tent. She stated they wondered what happened to us. We told them to keep the tent or dispose of it. They said they could store it for us till we came back again. We told them we didn't think we would come back anytime soon to go ahead and do whatever they wanted with it. We did not tell them about our experience because I thought they would think I was crazy. When I came across this site, I was hesitant to report it, but my girlfriend has encouraged me. I know that what I saw was not a bear and way too tall to be a man or even a tall man. All animals stopped making any sound and I smelled a skunk. Also, there was breaking of branches and movement. There was a lot of chaotic noise that sounded like a large animal ransacking our campsite. I read online of Bigfoot sightings in the Ocala National Forest. I also had an experience in a remote area of Chiefland, Florida in Levy County. In summer, I was on a 10-acre parcel way off a country road in a desolate area with only two other homes on the road. I was living in a bus that had been turned into an RV. I was staying out there, putting up a mobile home. I was purchasing the land from a friend, and we were building a septic system, and we had no power to the property at this time. The mobile home was set up at the back of the property near the woods, and the bus was behind the mobile home closer to the woods. I was using a small generator for power at the time. I had awakened before dawn, about 4 a.m., and was trying to make a pot of coffee with my generator. I sat there looking out into the woods, and I saw several pairs of red eyes, some far away and some very close to the bus. At first, I thought it was critters in the night. Then, I began to wonder how I could see their red eyes as dark as it was, and they were high enough up that they were as high as the windows on the bus. I thought critters in the trees, 
but then questioned how I could be seeing these red eyes when I've only seen the red eyes in animals due to a light reflection. These eyes seemed bigger than an animal's eyes, which made me very curious. I just sat there amazed while everyone else was sleeping. I had two small children with me also and did not want to wake them and scare them. I don't know what kind of eyes these were, but I always thought them to be very questionable. When the sun rose that morning, I rushed down to my friend's stand at the flea market that was helping me with this property. I told him he could have everything. Just get me a 32-foot U-Haul to get my family and furniture out of there. I'm going back to Daytona Beach, the city life. I don't know what I saw that early morning before daylight, but to this very day, I've always wondered how could I see the red eyes on those animals without a light reflection and how they could be as high up as high as the windows of the bus. It was very dark, but there was some lighting in the campground, and it was a warm, clear night, approximately 3 a.m. There were many lakes, deep forests, and springs. There was much wildlife. The forest is very dense and has a large area along State Road 40 that is desolate. On to the next one. If you're familiar with the Animal Ore Ice Festival in Colorado, you'll know the setting for my story. My name is Julie, and I grew up just a few miles down the road from Ore. It's a beautiful town, a popular tourist destination, as it's surrounded by high peaks and also beautiful red rock. They call it the Switzerland of America. Box Canyon, where the ice festival is held, is an impressive, deep, narrow gorge that spills from the high San Juan Mountains that surround Ore. The area is popular for ice climbing in the winter, but in the summer, after the snow and ice are gone, visitors can view the gorge from an enclosed catwalk that takes you right under Box Canyon Falls. In the spring, the thundering water is scary. I had an up-close and personal look at the gorge one time, even though it's hard to see such things in the dark, the ice festival always reminds me of my good fortune at still being alive, for I think luck was all that saved me that dark and stormy night, as Snoopy would say. It was a very high water year in Colorado. There was unusually deep snowfall, and all the rivers were raging. It was spring, and me and two friends decided it would be really epic to go visit the Thundering Falls in the light of the full moon. Of course, this is slightly illegal since the falls are one of those wonderful places that have been appropriated by clever capitalists who want to make a fast buck off things that truly should belong to all of us. In other words, the area is fenced and one has to pay a fee to visit. We wanted to see it in the full moon and the darn place was closed at night, so how else to see it but crawl over the fence? This is a skill we learned when we were kids and didn't have the money to get into a vent at the local fairground. All went well as we made it over the six-foot fence and on down into the catwalk above the falls, which was a once-in-a-lifetime thing to see. Record flows, just beautiful and very primal and scary in the moonlight. We stood there and hooted and hollered for some time. Then, not willing to leave well enough alone, we decided to go above the falls, where there's another lookout. It was pretty bright out with the full moon, plus we had flashlights. We took off, hiking the trail that winds up the hill above the canyon. Once up there, we hung around a while, again hooting and making all kinds of noise in our excitement. We finally headed back down the trail. As usual, I was the last one, holding up the rear, just walking along, when all of a sudden, I could feel the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I was being followed. I've since done a lot of research on this, and I recall reading one account on the internet where some campers near Ore reported hearing all sorts of strange calls during the night. The San Juan Mountains are a hotbed of activity, with quite a few accounts. What am I talking about? Bigfoot, 
right here in the heart of some of Colorado's most incredible mountain. Anyway, as I was walking along, keeping up the rear, I felt totally spooked all of a sudden. I stopped and listened. It was faint, but I swore I could hear a swish, swish noise behind me away. The swish, swish noise was caused by the thick bushes lining the narrow trail. And whatever it was, it was big enough that it was hitting the bushes as it walked along, making them swish. Now, I could no longer see the flashlights ahead of me. My friends were gone. I panicked. I needed to catch up. What was I thinking to stop? I started running as fast as one dares down a narrow path next to a deep gorge. I wanted to cry out, but now I was too terrified. I didn't want whatever it was to know I was alone, nor that I was a woman. Crying out would also convey the terror I felt, and I knew it was better to not let on when you're scared of something. I learned that in the context of a friend who had once been stalked by a cougar. She was hiking a trail over by Boulder, Colorado, and when she realized a cougar was following her, she started running in a panic which is the worst possible thing to do. Fortunately for her, she quickly came upon some other hikers who scared the animal away. But I knew this was no cougar. It was making way too much noise, and it had to be big to be hitting the bushes on either side of the trail. I'm not very religious, but I started praying. I was so scared, and now it was getting closer, and I could hear a thump, thump as it moved along the trail, the sound of something very large and heavy coming down on the ground, something with two feet. The San Juans have plenty of bears, but they're generally shy and leave people alone unless you leave food around. But they don't walk around on two legs. Was this possibly a person, another human, some madman out hiking in the moonlight? Not very likely. It was just too big. And it had no light, so it had to have good night vision. I was still running, but the trail was now a little uphill, and I was getting tired. Whatever was following me was not running. It had a huge stride and was easily keeping up with me. In fact, it was gaining, and I could now hear it breathing. I guess it was maybe a mere 20 feet behind me. I was now getting winded. I was in good shape. I've never been much of a runner. I get out of breath too easily. I can hike at a steady pace till the cows come home, even uphill. But when I start running, I get winded fast. A friend once told me I needed to learn how to breathe properly, but I never have. But at the altitude I was at, it wasn't that easy to breathe anyway. I started getting stomach cramps. My lungs were burning, and I could barely keep on. And yet, Whatever was behind me was steady. Its breathing was regular, like it was making no effort at all. I could hear it above my own puffing, so I knew it was close. And very large. I was mystified. Why, with all this running, hadn't I yet come up on my friend? How could they be that far ahead of me? And I saw no light. Nothing. It was like they had mysteriously disappeared. I wanted to stop. I could go no further, but yet I couldn't stop. I had to keep fleeing. Finally, I had such a bad catch in my side. The pain was so tremendous that I just kneeled over right there on the trail. I dropped to my knees and my flashlight tumbled from my hand. I hurt so bad. I didn't care if I died. I was going to die anyway from lack of oxygen. I kept on going down. I couldn't even stay on my knees. I rolled a bit to my side, and the next thing I knew, I was off the trail, falling into thin air. It was a feeling I don't care to repeat, but I will say, it certainly makes one feel alive, wondering if this is how you're going to die. It all happened so fast that it's hard to recall exactly what happened, but the next thing I knew, I was crammed between a large bush and the cliff, feet dangling into the abyss, like in the movies. I was still totally silent. I was still aware enough to keep my wits about me and not start yelling, 
Though I wanted to, believe me, it finally dawned on me what had happened. And I then tried really hard to control my breathing, so as not to gasp and make noise. Maybe the thing following me hadn't noticed my fall and had kept on going. It was difficult, but I was able to be pretty quiet, considering. I could feel the bush start to bend a bit, and I knew it was all that kept me from falling into the deep gorge, over 100 feet to the rocky bottom and the raging creek. Even if I survived the fall, I would drown in the dangerous waters. I managed to grab the bush and hold on and gradually caught my breath. I had just hung there for dear life, literally in the bright moonlight crammed between that bush and the rocky cliff. I finally managed to look up, trying to see how far the top was above me. And it was then that I saw it standing there, looking down at me, its glowing eyes maybe ten feet above. I must have gone into shock, because all I can remember is a pair of green eyes staring down at me from a massive black body. The eyes were steady and didn't blink and were very hypnotic. I remember feeling very sleepy, but I knew if I went to sleep, I would probably fall, so I quit looking at it. It was then that it started making the strangest noise I have ever heard. It was a combination of a clicking and a low, rumbling noise, like a faraway train. I don't remember anything that happened after that. It was as if I went to sleep or had my memory erased, but I didn't fall from the bush, so I must have been awake, but I just don't recall anything. I don't know what happened, but that clicking noise seemed to go right through my brain, and it left me with a headache that lasted three days, and I vaguely remember this big black hand grabbing my shirt, trying to get hold of me. Finally, I could hear voices in the distance. It was as if I had been asleep or something, it felt like a gap of time was missing. I looked back up, and the creature was gone. I started yelling at the top of my lungs. Before long, my friends came running, shining their light off the edge until they spotted me. The canyon wall had been a bit of an inward tilt where I was at, and they managed to somehow drag me back up onto the trail, whereupon I just lay there in shock, trying to process what had happened. I couldn't even talk. I finally was able to get up, and we slowly made our way back to the car, me in the middle as we walked down the trail. If that lowly bush hadn't been there, I know I wouldn't be telling the story right now. Later, after a few days, when I had regained enough stability to talk about it, we discussed what had happened that night. I apparently took off on a side trail when I started running, thus not catching up with my friend. They had quickly realized I wasn't with them and had backtracked all the way to the top, fearing the worst, but had missed me since I was on the trail. As they stood there at the top in the moonlight, trying to decide what to do, they also heard the sound I described. They said it had both a terrifying and calming effect on them. They knew I was where it was coming from and needed help, so they started walking towards it, but the sound soon stopped. They searched for me for a good ten minutes before they finally heard me yelling and found me. They never saw anything, but they believed my story about the black creature when I told them what had happened. So now, when I see ice climbers at Box Canyon, I think back to that night, and I feel that I already know what it feels like to fall, though fortunately not to land. I thought about going back up there and throwing a bottle of wine off the edge to thank the canyon god for my good fortune, but thinking back to that night, I decided to just drink it instead. No way I'll ever go back up there again. On to the next one. This is in Corydon in Harrison County in Indiana. Me and my roommate were watching a movie when we heard this ungodly sound from outside. It was this weird wail, howl, scream. It started out real low and guttural, like a cheap Frankenstein groan, and then shot up the octave range to an amazing high-pitched, wavery howl. 
It sounded like a cross between a woman screaming and a fire station. It got quiet for a minute, and then the screaming started up again, but it sounded like it had moved closer. All the dogs in the neighborhood went nuts. They sounded like they were dying or something. After the second wail stopped, I worked up the nerve to open the door and go outside. It smelled horrible outside, and I got the distinct impression I was being watched. So I went back inside and hoped that whatever it was, it was gone. I worked third shift and sometimes there was a god-awful smell in the air when I got home from work. Not the farm smells either. This was a nasty, musky, rotten smell that seemed to stick to your skin. The other witness was my old roommate, Daryl. We were watching a movie. I think it was The Prophecy. Plus any neighbors that heard it. I heard that a large, hairy thing had been seen in the area before. I didn't believe it till I heard that noise. It was about one in the morning, and it had just rained a while ago, but it was a clear and starry night at the time. The area is farmed, heavily wooded in spots with lots of sinkholes. On to the next one. I was sleeping when I heard a loud screaming sound. I got up to see what it was. I went to my back door and looked out the back door and I didn't see anything, but I kept hearing this loud scream, so I turned on the light and it stopped. I looked around and I didn't see anything, so I went back to bed. Then, a few months later, I was watching sightings and they played a soundtrack of a Bigfoot. I almost fell out of my chair. It was the exact same scream I had heard. I have moved from that house and I live closer to the Ohio River now, but every time I hear that scream, it sends chills up and down my back. It is a wet area with a creek and a dried up pond. It is close to the old ammunition plant in the Jeffersonville area that almost runs from Jeffersonville to Charlestown, Indiana. On to the next one. Within the boundaries of Wolf Cave Nature Preserve at McCormick Creek State Park near Spencer in Owen County in Indiana, a very low moan howl was heard with a duration of five to six seconds. This initial moan was followed by a dog barking and a number of shorter low grunt like sounds. The sound was at an estimated distance of 100 to 500 yards northwest of our position. Myself, 28, a brother-in-law, 33, and two four-year-olds, a boy and a girl, decided to take a nighttime hike to Wolf Cave, which is about three quarters of a mile from the family camping area of McCormick Creek State Park. Our group hiked to the cave and briefly explored the mouth of the cave. The children wanted to go into the cave, but the dad, not being in the mood to crawl around in the dirt at night, decided no one would go far into the cave. We sat in the cave mouth talking for about 10 minutes and then decided to hike back. About a tenth of a mile from the cave, the moan was heard by the two fathers in the direction of behind us to the right. I initially heard the sound quite clearly, but... Not wanting to alarm the children, I said nothing. About two seconds after the noise, my brother-in-law, a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, asked me what the sound was. I replied, I don't know. We then heard a dog bark further away and some short, deep noises in the vicinity of the first moan. He then asked me if I thought the sound was made by an animal, and I again repeated, I don't know. About ten steps later, I suggested we put the children on our shoulders and make some time. He agreed. No further sounds were heard. The time was approximately 10.30 p.m. CDT. The terrain inside Wolf Cave Nature Preserve is thick and deciduous forest, mostly ash and oak. Like much of the southwest Indiana, the area is very hilly and filled with a many ravines 
limestone rock outcroppings and cliffs. The cave and surrounding area is quite heavily visited during the day. The cave itself is small and had nothing to do with the sound. The Owen State Forest borders the park and the whole region is fairly roadless and borders the White River. When the sound was heard by our party, we were walking up the side of a ravine near the back of the preserve. On to the next one. In Washington County in Indiana, my sighting of what I believe to have been a Sasquatch was quite brief, though I did get a decent look. My mother and I were visiting my aunt, and I was asked to go out to the car to get my mother's cigarette. I went outside and walked over to the car and grabbed the cigarette. When I got back out of the car and went to close the door, I noticed something moving in the field next to my aunt's property. A very large and definitely bipedal animal was walking down the field toward the woods. It walked with a long and sort of slouched gait. It was either covered with a really dark brown or black fur and had rather long arms that swung loosely as it moved. It crossed the distance of at least 200 feet in less than 20 seconds. As soon as it reached the woods, I walked into the house and must have sat for at least half an hour trying to process what I'd just seen. I was only 13 at the time. In the field close to the area, I'd noticed several spots where something had bedded down. I just figured it was a deer, but... I did notice an unpleasant odor around them once or twice. Also, since reading through this and other sites concerning Bigfoot research, I did notice some things in the woods. Groups of large sticks stacked in a tent-like fashion. I just thought it was the kids in the area doing it. It could still be that. There were no other witnesses. I was only going out to the car to fetch something. The time was an early afternoon and it was a clear, sunny day. The area is overgrown field directly off to the right of the road. There was a small grove of trees near the field. Also, across the road from these trees, there was a few acres of wood with at least one small creek running through them. I did hear that a couple years later, some kids said that they were followed by a Bigfoot near the wood, just a quarter of a mile down the road from where I had my sighting. On to the next one. Near Jefferson Proving Ground in Jefferson County in Indiana, I am writing a report of a sighting I had while I was deer hunting. I have been hunting since I was 10 years old, and I have been hunting by myself since I was 13. My friend and I were picked for a special bow deer hunt in southern Indiana, Jefferson Proving Grounds. I had set up my tree stand along a fire break where I could see both the opening and the wood line ahead of me. I had observed several deer around my stand about 1230 that day, and I took a shot at one of them. I tracked the deer across the fire break and into the wood where I lost his trail because of the dense briars and rose bushes. I could hardly walk through the stuff, so after about 30 minutes, I returned to my stand throughout the afternoon. I watched the Air Force do practice runs over a restricted bombing area not far from where I was. Later that evening, when things had finally quieted down, I heard some howling off in the distance. I figured that it was a pack of coyotes. About five minutes after they quieted down, I began hearing some noise coming toward me from the deep woods. I thought that it was a deer running from the coyotes. I first saw it about 50 yards out coming toward me. It was about dark, and as any hunter knows, that's the best time to see and shoot a deer. I was ready and watching for an opening. When I had my first opening to get a shot, I noticed that it was not a deer, but appeared to be a hunter. I watched as the figure ran across the opening through the brush to a second opening and then to a third opening where it crossed the fire break and then back into the woods behind me. I thought it was odd because I had never seen a hunter dumb enough to run through the woods 
during the prime hunting season, what was even more scary was the fact that it had taken me 10 minutes to walk through the same brush that this thing had run through in 20 seconds. It was completely black from head to toe and had a hump shape on its back. It stood about six foot six inches. The reason I can say that is because I'm six foot one and this thing was bigger than I am. I waited in my stand for a few minutes and then I got down and walked fast back to my truck. I met my buddy who was over the hill about 500 yards and he said that he heard whatever it was going through the brush but never saw it. I told him that it was a Bigfoot and he laughed at me until he could see how serious I was about the thing. We asked the checkout center if anyone else was hunting in the area and they said that we were the only hunters in that area and two areas around that. My hunting partner heard it as it ran through the wood after crossing the field, but did not see it. It was approaching dark, but still light enough to hunt. It was an open field with pockets of brush forth to the rear of the witness. On to the next one. I believe in the species commonly known as Bigfoot or as the natives call them, the hairy man. These names are a bit misleading for the simple fact they make it sound as if there is only one creature traveling the world being spotted, but the truth is they live in tribes. I don't know how I know this, but it sits in my brain and grows stronger and stronger as I talk to other people who've been witness to the hairy people. I've had several experiences up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I believe that humans aren't at the top of the food chain like history would like us to buy into. I was born and raised in Washington State, spending my childhood with my grandparents traveling around during the summers, camping, fishing, catching crayfish, crabs, and digging clams. As a little dude, I had a lot of interesting adventures giving me a strong foundation for the love of nature and a great respect for our natural resources. My grandfather was a Vietnam vet, and this gave us free access to all of the campgrounds and RV parks. I am also completely blind due to cancer, and so I was able to camp for free as well, which meant my family and friends would often take me with them to save a bit of money. I didn't mind it, since it gave me more time out in the woods, running through creeks, climbing trees, and shooting guns with my dad. My blindness never slowed me down or gave me reason to fear the unknown. And I only mention it here because it's an important piece to the experience I had at the age of 12. The legend surrounding blind people talks about superhuman senses like hearing, smell, and touch. But the truth is, blind people simply rely on the other four senses more, so they're adapted to build a picture of one surrounding. As I tell you what happened, I'll build the picture from my perspective and give you the facts as I witnessed them. School was out for the summer, and I was 11 or 12 at the time, and my grandparents organized a family camping trip. We'd be going out to our favorite camping area. They had just gotten an RV and would be using that as our main operation center for the four tents two trucks with canopies, and my cousin Steve, who decided to sleep under the stars on a picnic table in his sleeping bag. My other cousin CJ was more like my twin brother than a cousin. We did everything together, and we both would witness these events as well. We spent a day prepping our gear and loading up the vehicle, and let me tell you, prepping enough camping gear for 15 to 20 people take some strong communication skills and a list of goals that could probably choke a Bigfoot. The RV was packed full, barely leaving enough space for extra passengers. So my dad and I, we drove out to the creek in his Ford Ranger with a shell over the back where he and I would sleep. My cousin CJ rode with his mom, two sisters, and his older brother Steve. My uncle had his own tent and caught a lift with my grandparents in the RV. The camper's convoy made its way to the creek in the early evening, 
and we spent some time looking for a big enough clearing to hold all of our vehicles and tents that ensured us kids would be safe while playing. Weston Creek is known to the locals as a place to hang out and party, but when it's calm, it's amazing. Bats come out at night from caves along the creek and waterfalls fill small pools where dinner plate sized trout wait for the great worm from the sky. As young guys, CJ and I weren't afraid to roam around checking out our environment. The brash confidence of teens. I mean, after all, we both had high powered slingshots, a hunting knife each, along with several pocket knives and the handy lighter. We waded across the creek and explored the tree line a bit. This side of the creek wasn't set up for camp, but instead was thick with trees and brush. Some big animals had made trails down to the water and into blackberry thicket. We found hoof prints, so we thought deer, maybe some elk, travel through there most often. Up the creek was a good-sized waterfall, where we found a deep pool at the bottom with some crawdad and, tucked away under some rocks, a catfish or two. The water was cold, but it was late August, and we were having a patch of high 90 days with no rain. We took a few shots with our slingshot and, after several good-sized rocks were implanted into a dead log, we figured we'd had the skills of sharpshooters. Each time the rock slammed into the log, it made a loud, hollow thunk, and we thought this was good fun. After some time, we circled back round to camp and grabbed some food and told our family what we found. We were then put to work carrying and dashing the beer in the creek to keep it cold. So, CJ and I were filling the trash bags with cans of beer and sinking them in the creek with big river stones. And of course, any time an adult wanted beer, it was our job to go fish them out and rethink the bag. My cousin and I got a kick accidentally letting a can here and there go floating down the river. We'd walk the creek later on and never did find where the cans had caught up on the shores. The first night was the usual excitement of being out in the woods and eating a meal cooked over the fire. Everyone was full of energy, and sleep wasn't pursued until one or two in the morning. The first night was the night we noticed the bats flying out up near the waterfall up the creek from us. They flew all over, catching bugs, and our camp had light along with the fire, which was drawing the bugs in like crazy. These bats were feasting 20 feet above our head while we talked about the upcoming fishing trip. My cousin Steve, who is accident prone, was carving a stick with a pocket knife and ended up slicing open his hand, causing a nice puddle of blood on the ground. We threw hot ash over the spilled blood and then dumped a bucket of water over it, hoping to hide the smell with the burnt wet ash. After that, we all started to get tired, and by three in the morning, we were out. CJ and I were sleeping in the RV top bunk over the driver's cab. It had room for two full-sized adults to sleep up there, so for us, we had enough room to set up our own sleeping bags, and it worked great. We'd move around camp each night, trading other cousins for spots in the tent on and under the picnic table, although that was quickly stopped after the second night. It was the first night and after joking about peeing the bed, we crashed in the RV's top bunk, where there was an air vent that could be opened and grant access to the roof. Overnight, it rained a bit, and we woke up the next morning with our sleeping bags soaking wet. We found some interesting boulders stacked in odd formation. These were huge rocks that would have taken six or seven people to lift. The stone structures were along the far bank of the creek, on the forested side where no one really camped. Our curiosity did lead us to explore the large stack, and what we discovered was they gave a darn good view of the campsite without letting campers across the creek see you from behind the rock. I also got good whiff of a skunk-like smell or wet dog on the backside of the stack. The day wore on as we collected rock, raised a little ruckus with nature, and ate the usual summer food. Burger, steak, hot dog, and of course, bacon. Yeah, my family knows how to camp, and this is why we were visited. Free creek chilled beer and possible food scraps sounds like a good target for the local population of raccoons, and boy, did they sweep in and clean up camp.
We went to bed again in the RV and fell asleep fairly quickly. And I remember waking up at one o'clock. We were woken by something outside the RV moving around. The RV's door started jiggling as the handle was tested. Luckily, this door had two deadbolts plus a chain. Although, if it was Bigfoot, I didn't think a chain would keep him or her out. The RV had a good-sized fridge, and that's where we stored all of the fish meat along with leftovers. My cousin and I kept real quiet as the 30-foot RV began rocking side to side. It was as if a mosh pit of punk rockers were attempting to flip the RV to get inside. My cousin called out, asking who it was. We both thought it might have been someone wanting inside to use the bathroom. No one answered, but the rocking stopped, and something large slapped the window just right of the door and cracked a panel. We both shut up quickly and laid down, trying not to make a sound, as something brushed along the side of the RV. We could hear heavy breathing, much like a horse's deep breath. There were several loud thumps on the roof just next to the air vent, and then we heard the sound of something large moving across the gravel toward the trees. Our grandparents could be heard snoring away as they slept through the whole 30 seconds of the RV rocking. CJ braved to look. However, and as he looked out across the camp, he swears he saw a large, no, gigantic, dark and bipedal person and shadow move in and out of the firelight that was still flickering. Massive, whatever it was, broad too, tall, and all of a sudden, through the window on the top of the RV, he and I could smell that nasty skunk or wet dog smell again. After a long night, we finally fell asleep. For several hours, the smell of cooking bacon and eggs woke us up around 7.30, along with the amazing smell of campfire brewed coffee, which covered the area in the smell of morning. No more wet dog smell, that was for sure. We gathered around the campfire, with most of the family chowing down on the usual feast. We asked if anyone had tried to enter the RV last night, and everyone said no. CJ and I then told them about our 1 a.m. visitor attempting to get into the RV. My cousin Steve mentioned that he heard and saw someone moving through camp, but he assumed it was someone hanging out by the fire. He said the shadow was large and for sure wasn't an animal. His mom was worried about a cougar and us youngsters running around. Some ideas of pranksters was tossed around or maybe a bear scratching its back on the RV trying to get inside for the food. I did mention CJ's own visual, and that's when the prankster talk started. My grandmother, who is passed on now, she had the bloodline of several tribes, and she had the stories. So, the hairy man was told that morning, and you know the story, it's pretty common. But, as young teens, we were ready to hunt this thing down with our slingshot. Oh, and our twenty-two rifles used for taking down overly aggressive beer can. A blind dude and his cousin ready to take out Bigfoot using medieval level weaponry. I miss them days just a little bit. Now that we had the idea of Bigfoot in our mind, we investigated and found a large handprint left in blood on the window with the broken panel. The door handle had what seemed to be, we thought, a bloody fingerprint smeared. On the roof, we found a dead raccoon missing its head with a pool of blood baking in the sun later that day. After this discovery, all children slept in the vehicle and the camping trip was cut short by a few days. We would have stayed for two weeks, but only stayed for about four days. I found out later on from my gramp that he found a large footprint down near the creek directly across from one of the rock stacks. This still makes my mind turn at times, were these big creatures intelligent enough to come up with tactics to steal from campers? The third day, we went out to a nearby fishing area that was up the road, I remember, just a few miles, and because we were adults in our minds, we thought it was cool to ride the bed of the truck drinking sodas and talking about fishing. We even had enough time to prep our poles with hooks and wait ready for catfish and bass. The fishing was pretty decent, and we finished around nine or so. It was twilight and the moon was rising. 
While on the way back to camp, however, VJ noticed a large black figure walking up on a logged out hillside. The figure was moving from one side of the clearing to the other side and did so at a swift run. VJ and I were certain it was Bigfoot and camping was getting interesting. My family may or may not remember this as clearly as I do, but for some reason, I have an excellent memory and spend my free time writing. This is the basic story I've told to friends multiple times. I didn't add any details to make it seem fictionalized. I stuck to the events as they happened. The location is real, and the only names I've changed are my family members for their own privacy. Throughout my adult life, I've had other experiences out in the woods of Washington, which lead me to believe humans aren't alone and bears don't build tree structures or stack rock for increased coverage. My friends have their own experiences with a hairy man, and together we feel they're out there and we should leave them be. On to the next one. I was living in the area of the Coal River near to Lower Falls. At that time, one of my favorite pastimes was musky fishing, with three of my favorite locations being Middle Island Creek, Hughes River, and the Little Kanawha. There were some muskies running through here in the 30 to 40 pound class, and besides casting a jointed plug for them, I had a certain technique that used to be very effective in getting the big boys. Before I continue with my story, I will attempt to describe to you and your listeners what I used to do. My technique was to first catch some sunfish, suckers, or chubs to use as bait. I would then hook them lightly through the back and hang them from drop lines on some of the bushes along the shoreline. I would use a big slip knot on the dropper so that the fish would be held slapping the water's surface with only the largest of fish being able to pull the slip knot free. The other technique which I used was to trail a live sunfish or sucker behind my lure with no weight. At any rate on this day, I had portaged my canoe into the Little Kanawha River, and I was working the area just below what was known as the falls at Bolthound. I had caught more than a few sunfish and had begun tying them to numerous bushes around an area of about one acre of water. My plan was always, after having secured the baits, to paddle out of the area and remain still along the bank. From there, I would stay in a position where I could see all activity regarding any bait being taken. For the sake of your listeners who don't fish, a fish flapping around on the surface may be the best attractant known to man for getting a predator's attention of raccoon and foxes on the shore. One day, I even saw a black bear with cubs peering out of the bushes, looking at the commotion in the water. Now, this must be fishing. As a matter of fact, any fishing is subject to the fish being in the area or coming into the area while you are there. The technique was proven, and all I had to do now was sit and wait. I was in the canoe, hugging the shore, about a hundred feet from my nearest bait and some two hundred feet from the farthest. I had eight bait in the water, and they were making quite a commotion on the surface. I had been holding my position for almost an hour, and the activity level of the hooked fish was waning as they tired. In some cases, they were beginning to die. Suddenly, there was a huge splash, and the slip knot dropped on one of the bait furthest away from me. I was looking at the activity with great intent and grabbing my paddle when suddenly a large hairy arm followed by the upper body of a huge hairy beast leaned out of the brush and grabbed the branch and the line that was attached to the fish. I was so shocked by what I was seeing that I froze in my seat hoping to God that this monster would not see me. The beast which I know now was a Bigfoot tore the entire branch from the brush including the line, and pulled the fish out of the river and into the woods. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. By the way, this technique that I was using was well known and used by many other individuals along the river. It seemed to me in that moment that this beast had not only been watching me, but perhaps many others. 
I say this because it had obviously been in hiding within the bushes and was well familiar with the line being attached to the bush. To my way of thinking, the Bigfoot had actually allowed me to catch the fish for it. When I saw the creature, it had bent fully forward from its waist, reaching out over the riverbank to grab the branch. From my angle, what I was seeing of its body, which was from the upper thigh to the head, had to be all of six feet. When it extended its arm and hand, the arm was enormous, with the forearm being maybe eight or nine inches thick, and the upper arm perhaps sixteen inches or better. Its entire body was covered in long, dark brown hair, with the palms of its hands and face being somewhat blackened. Understand me, please. In these parts and in those times, there had been many folk tales and stories of such beasts and others, which had been passed down and kicked around forever. But never had I nor any of my cronies ever seen such a monster with her own two eyes. And believe me when I tell you that me and some of the good old boys spent quite a bit of time in the deepest and darkest recesses of the region, both hunting and fishing. I had always said if there was any truth to these things, then we would see them. And now I had. On to the next one. I lived in Cave Junction, and my parents had a few acres off the main road to the Oregon Caves, which didn't get all that many visitors then. I was a teenager, and I spent a lot of my free time roaming the forest up there around the cave. The rangers knew me and were used to me crawling out of the brush with a squirrel or rabbit in my hand. I don't know how many people are even aware of it, but there's another cave up there. I came on it by accident when I was climbing along a ledge downhill from the Oregon Cave Chateau. I was armed with my slingshot and a pocket full of stones, and I could climb like a monkey in those days. And I saw some sort of critter that I thought to be a coyote, but all I saw was a flash out of the corner of my eye, so it could have been a fox, especially that high up in the mountains. I had to go beneath the main road, and I climbed down over a lot of rocks that I think were pushed there when they built the road to the cave. Finally, I ended up on a sort of fairly flat ledge where there was an animal trail that led further down the mountain. Even though it was blocked in both places by rocks, I was able to follow it, and all of a sudden, I saw this large shape through the pines up ahead. I thought it was a bear, and I was just about ready to climb up to get away from there quick, because bears are really scary when they've got cubs, when the thing stood up on hind legs and was staring at me. I didn't know what to do. I was frozen in place. My feet wouldn't move, and I was just standing there paralyzed when it kind of snorted and let out a growl and turned and ran the other way. That gave me courage, so I cautiously followed it for probably 100 feet further down the slope until it came around a large boulder by a tall pine tree and there was a cave. I knew I was not following a bear, and whatever it was, it had run in fear of me, which made me braver than I should have been. The entrance was back under a ledge, and it was a small opening, which made me duck slightly, which I carefully did. Having no flashlight, I went in just a couple of feet, where the cave got bigger, and when my eyes adjusted, I just knelt there and looked around. The cave seemed like it went way back, and I could see some reflection that looked like there might be some light from a crack in the ceiling, but that's as far as my young courage went. I carefully backed out the way I came because even if that mountain ape was scared of me, it was also twice as big as my youthful frame. So I backed out and just about then I started shaking all over and I climbed as fast as I could once my legs started working again. When I got to the road, I made my way up to the main entrance to the monument where I saw a ranger truck and flagged him down. The man didn't seem surprised about the ape creature, and he said several of the park employees had reported seeing it. Then I told him about the cave, 
and he knew too. He said they believed it was a cavern that stretched east for many miles, but they didn't have funds for exploring it. When I told my folks about the sighting, I realized my mistake immediately. That mountain was suddenly off limits to me. Not long after that, we moved, and I'd almost forgot about it until my son mentioned Bigfoot. So, here is my story. I wonder if they ever opened that other cave. On to the next one. Strange phantom beings occupy a place somewhere between ghosts and hauntings and sightings of seemingly material objects. The story of the M Brothers. The account is set in Antinogish Harbor, Nova Scotia, and we meet young Dan M as he was about to travel to the town of Antigonish. Dan was to accompany a man who was recognized as the town drunk. The two men were very late arriving home, fearing that they had been spooked off their horses by the things on North River Hill. Dan's mother sent his younger brother Alex out to search for him. Alex followed the trail that the two riders should have taken and found Dan trying to keep his drunken companion upright on his horse. The two young men did not want to take their inebriated fellow back to his widowed mother's home, so they dragged him back to their own house. Before they arrived, however, they noted that they were being trailed by a big black dog, which they could not drive off. The brothers hauled the drunk up the back stairs, careful to avoid their father, who disapproved of alcohol, and careful to lock the door against the persistent dog. After tucking their burden into bed, the two brothers came back downstairs to discover, to their horror, that the black dog had passed through the locked door and was headed up the stairs. Here, the story gets even stranger. The dog, for some unknown reason, was unable to pass the door of the M Brothers' sisters. Instead, the beast traveled up and down the stairs all night as Alex sat vigil over the drunken man, praying that the thought might be rescued from the imminent death that the black dog represented. The black dog disappeared by morning, and the drunkard awoke sober. It was said that after hearing the story, the drunken man reformed completely and died a good death at home years later. The phantom black dog is often viewed as a harbinger of death, thus the worry of Alex and his brother over seeing the dog in their home. What is also clear in the lore is that these phantom beings can also serve a protective function. Another Canadian story about a phantom black dog comes from a witness who was 85 at the time of the interview. The woman had lived in Canada for some time in her youth before returning to her native Somerset, England. The witness gives this short but interesting account. When I was a young girl, I was living outside Toronto in Canada, and I had to go to a farm some miles away one evening. There were woods on the way, and I was greatly afraid. But a large black dog came with me and saw me safely to the door. When I had to return, he again appeared and walked with me till I was nearly home. Then he vanished, as is often the case in the less terrifying black dog encounters this young woman seemed to be accompanied by an ordinary, if large, black dog. It was only when the creature vanished before her eyes that the witness understood that she had undergone a paranormal event. We see this often in the black dog lore from England, where a witness will only realize that something phantom is afoot when they try to pet the large black dog or drive it off with a stick or umbrella and the hand or object passes right through the dog. The phantom black dog is a fascinating and mysterious subject. While the black dogs do sometimes interact with the physical environment, it seems that they are creatures of the other world who appear and disappear in our world for reasons known only to them. 
black dogs are not the only phantoms that appear in Canada. The Great White North also has several stories of phantom trains. The first of our ghost train seems to have been a harbinger apparition. The year was 1908, and the conductor of the Lethbridge train in Alberta was a man named Bobby Tuhay. The conductor was working with his fireman, Gus Day, coupling cars on the track near Dunmore Junction, just outside of Medicine Hat, when he spotted the headlights of an oncoming train. The train appeared to be on the same track, and Tuhay, realizing he could not escape, yelled for his fireman to jump. Day bailed out of the engine he was in, but the train that came barreling at the pair simply veered to the right and flashed past. With its whistle blowing, Tuhay was amazed. There was only one track for a train in that area, and the conductor testified that he had been able to see lit coach windows and even passengers as the phantom train raced towards him. Tuhay was so frightened that he was out sick for a couple of days, and even after he returned to work, it wasn't long before he was out ill again. He requested that he be taken off the Dunmore Junction run, and his friend, Jim Nicholson, took his place. Gus Day, the fireman, who had witnessed the first event, accompanied Nicholson. Nicholson and Day experienced the exact same episode about three kilometers outside of Medicine Hat, with a seemingly real train coming headlong at them on the same track and then veering off into a non-existent trackway. Again, the conductor Nicholson stated that he could see the passengers in the train's lighted cars. Nicholson told Tuhay what he had seen, and Tuhay was greatly relieved. Tuhay figured that if two people had seen the phantom train, then it must not be a death portent. As it happened, he was incorrect. Tuhay had replayed Nicholson as the conductor for the Spokane Flyer, and at 8.30 hours on July 8, 1908, the Spokane Flyer, conducted by Bob Tuhay, and the Lethbridge train, conducted by Jim Nicholson, collided with a crash that was heard by half the population of Medicine Hat. Both conductors and five other crew members were killed. In any event, the phantom train of Medicine Hat now has a solid place in the history of psychic accounts. Passengers could be seen in the Medicine Hat event and sounds could be heard, but that is not always the case. As in the tale of the phantom train of Cape Breton Island, some years ago, people who live on a certain hill at Barraquas, Cape Breton, used to watch a phantom train glide noiseless around the headlands of the Brass Odor and come to a stop at the gate leading to one of the houses. One who saw it herself told me at seven o'clock every evening for a whole month every family on the hill would go out of doors to see it. Every coach was lighted, but no people could be seen. At the hour of its approach, some people sometimes went down to the track to get a better look at it, but were disappointed at its not coming at all, although watchers on the hill saw it as usual. At the end of the month, a man was killed by a train just at the gate to which the phantom train used to come. Nobody saw it afterwards. On Prince Edward Island, this phantom train is seemingly an ongoing apparition and not a death portent. The phantom train of Wellington made its first appearance in December of 1885 outside the village of Wellington. The apparitional train was seen by about 40 villagers who were celebrating a wedding at a place called Mill House, but who had remained to grieve the death of a drowned youngster. There was no scheduled train, so the villagers were astonished to hear a train whistle and see the bright beams of a headlight that illuminated the front of Mill House. The witnesses testified to seeing a train pull up, then pull away and vanish after passengers had boarded. The phantom train was seen at odd times in the Wellington area, most commonly on December evenings. While no death was predicted by this event, there is certainly a strong death motif to the story. 
The villagers were mourning the passage of a youngster when the phantom train was first sighted, and the apparition is most commonly seen in December evenings, a time when, in the European tradition, the dead availed themselves of the long nights to walk the earth. In the last story, the train of Cape Breton seemed to be awaiting its passenger. In this account, it seems that the train is more or less a permanent fixture that stops by periodically, perhaps to collect the souls of the dead. Phantom Dogs and Phantom Trains what other ethereal phenomena might we find in the annals of Canadian lore? Joshua Cutchton gives us phantom smoke. Contrary to the old adage, it would seem that where there is smoke, there is not always fire. The Market Square in Oakville, Ontario, has served as a community hub since the early 19th century, hosting both the town hall and jailhouse. Both buildings were burned to the ground twice, Investigator Jennifer Tyrell reports that close to Halloween, the acrid smell of something burning is very distinctive around the market. Cutchton notes that it is possible that smoke from some distant source is being smelt, but one wonders why it is this particular time of year near Halloween or the old Celtic feasts of the ancestor Samhain when the smoke makes its appearance. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!